Steve. Hey, Josh, how's it going? You're muted, Josh. Yeah, you're still on mute. Okay, can you hear me now? Yeah. Yes. There we uh, go. How are you? How are you doing? Pretty good. How are you guys? Great. Fine. Good. That's good. Sweet. So yeah, this is a uh, a friend Travis. Um, he can help you answer some of those questions you had about the Book of Mormon. Thanks for Maybe. reading the whole. Yeah. <laughs> yeah Thanks for reading fast. the Book of Mormon. Though. Yeah, I really enjoyed it. Actually. Good. Yeah, one of the questions I did have um, was, like, how was it? Was it more of a direct translation or more of a loose translation? Because, um, like, I noticed one yes. of the things I noticed was the word, like, Christ being used a lot. And just my knowledge of the Bible, I know that's, like, a Greek word, um, meaning anointed one. So, like, I was wondering, like, if it's more of a loose translation because that makes sense to me that if it would be a loose translation sense of the people in the 1830s would understand that word christ yeah so no yeah so a a, a loose versus a tight so whether i mean I, I guess i'd have to ask you what you mean by loose versus tight what exactly like, is it that you understand that those mean? A good, I guess, a good example would be a the difference between different like Bible translations. For instance, I, there is one Bible translation I really don't like. It's called the uh, what is it? The Message. Like it's a very very loose translation. Uh -huh. um, and then there's the Psalm that that talks about uh, David. I think it's one of David's Psalms where he says like, "Wash me with hyssop." Um, but the message translates it in more modern lingo, which is wash me like a washing machine. Um, so like that, like loose, that's like very, very loose translation that basically takes in the ancient understanding of like how you would purify a piece of cloth or something and then kind of does it, it, it translates it in a more modern way, like. Today we use washing mach machines instead of using hyssop. Um, so I guess that's what I mean by the difference. Like when Joseph was translating the plates, was it was the translation as close as possible to the original, or was there like creative license to maybe change some some of the words so that more modern people in the 1830s could grasp different concepts? Yeah. So yeah. So I, I get. I think I get what you mean. So we we actually couldn't know that for certain there's no way to know the answer to that question and the reason is is because joseph smith didn't translate the book of mormon in the way that we often understand the word translate so in lds thought so in the way that the way that you could because so the our our theology our our church our culture is often difficult for people outside of it to understand and it's it's sometimes not apparent to members why it is that people misunderstand us. But, mm -hmm. and the reason I'm telling you that is, is that oftentimes negative perspectives uh, against the church are often predicated on a misunderstanding of how we're using certain words. That's common for most groups. Usually outsiders who are looking at the group often are critical of certain things because of the way they use the, they use their certain language. So recently, um, you know, I, I kind of act as a as an amateur apologist for my faith. I don't really like the word apologist because it's it seems like um, a lot of people, especially with Latter-day Saint theology, they have a negative connotation of that word because mm -hmm. they think that what you're trying to do effectively is what they see apologist. They think an excuse maker, basically yeah. somebody who's rather than somebody who defends, which to me, an apologist is somebody who contextualizes information. I don't, I don't really care if you believe in LDS claims or not, but what I would like you to do is at least correctly understand how we understand it. And that's what I believe that I'm trying to do. 
you know, whether whether people walk away saying, I agree with you or not, I at least want you to understand what the claim is. I know it's a lot of words, but but bear with me for a minute. So in, in consequence of kind of thinking in that way, um, earlier today, somebody sent me a screenshot of a conversation they thought was pretty funny. And it was a, a, a site that's kind of de dedicated to attacking the church. Um, and there's lots of these because attacking our church is kind of a... Um, it's a it's a it's kind of like beating up on the weak kid. So our church doesn't do a lot to defend itself overtly in the media or in social media or anything like that. We just kind of let people say whatever they want and we just hope that the truth will out. So what happens is sometimes people will leave the church and people who have either a, a negative perspective on the church or want to feed into negative perspectives on the church will often. Um, so um, in the process of kind of, of kind of doing that, what they'll do is they'll kind of feed negative people. And it's just kind of like politically, the different political parties, they feed the talking points of their base. That's kind of what these people do. They know that there's a certain sentiment among certain people, and that sentiment is popular, so they just feed it. And they feed it with whatever it wants to eat, right? So this particular mm -hmm. group is is engaged in that kind of behavior where they're feeding the people, they're feeding the trolls, so to speak. And so one of the things that they did is in a recent uh, address, the leader of our church, who's the president of the church, Russell M. Nelson, made a statement that ancient prophets, and he included Adam and Moses, etc., made the same covenants with God that we make today. That's what he said. Well, a lot of the people that are kind of taking this this comment are not member are, are former members of the church but what they're representing is is that that making covenants means that they engaged in the same temple ritual that we do today and that is not the claim so in our temples we make covenants that are consistent with marriage and chastity etc right mm -hmm. making those covenants in the ancient time wouldn't have looked like it does today. So there's been an adoption of that covenant into a context in which we are currently presented that we engage in certain actions to, to receive those covenants that maybe Moses or Abraham or, or Noah, et cetera, wouldn't have done. But the covenant, the promise that they would have made would have been the same. So that's all the president of the church is saying is that they would have made the same promises not necessarily that they had temples like Latter-day Saints do today. So their joke is, is that that claim is, is factually untrue because obviously Moses and Abraham and, and such didn't build modern type LDS temples and go into them and perform the same kind of ritual that we do today. They didn't. We're not claiming that either. We're just claiming that the same covenants were, were, were received. And the covenants are consistent with the things that are contained in the Ten Commandments. So those are those are things that would have been standing laws or standing methods of God transmitting information to his children, and they would have been consistent throughout time. So our, our current president of the church is just identifying that we're not removed from God because we're making the same covenants as the ancient Israelites and even the, the first century Christians would have made. So that's kind of how it works. So it's important to kind of take the vernacular, the words that are used by a group, and understand them as the group would. And one of those words is translated. So when Joseph Smith was translating, he wasn't actually translating. Joseph Smith wasn't a scholar of Hebrew or Greek or any other language. He wouldn't have had the capacity or ability academically to do what you explained with this. What, what did you call it? What was the translation? Because it sounds horrible. It's the, mass the message. Yeah, so, <laughs> and, yeah, and I hope I don't offend you, but another another biblical translation that I, I don't like is the NIV. I think it's also yeah. kind of garbage. I, I, I Most academics use the NRSV, the New, York, New Revised Standard Version. It's a better translation. And again, tight translation, what I, what I talk to a lot of people who are not members of our faith that are Christians of another stripe, when they, when they talk about translation, they're like, well, it's a literal translation. It's a word-for-word -word translation. Anytime they say that, I know that they don't understand how translation works because there's no such thing as a word-for-word -word translation. 
I mean, if you were to do a word for word translation from the Hebrew or Greek into English, it would look like word salad nonsense, right? You, yeah. you might be able to kind of figure it out, but obviously scholars have to add a lot of ands and ises and thes and, and commas and punctuation into the text that aren't contained in the Hebrew or the Greek. So there is no such thing as a literal translation. It's just the opinions of the scholar based on their understanding of the complexities of the grammar of that language. And obviously those things can change as scholars discover more manuscripts in that language dating to that time, they can actually alter their understandings of words, which is why they're constantly updating translations of the Bible, right? Well, Joseph Smith wasn't doing that. And obviously our claim is, and of course the missionaries have probably made you aware of this, we don't have the golden plates that are allegedly the source of the Book of Mormon. And even if we did, they were written, as is mentioned in the Book of Mormon, they were written in basically an academic form of some kind of a, and I guess a, a good word would be kind of a bastardized language, where they had taken something that looked Egyptian, combined it with something that looked Hebrew, and then whatever time had changed or metamorphosed. But the, the, the prophets in the Book of Mormon that are working on the record keeping. So there's this record keeping class. You've read the whole book, correct? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So as you read through it, you saw the plates are passed, right? Yeah. Often father to son, but not always. But ultimately, you know, there's a kingly class, uh, a priestly class, but these are scholarly classes that are trained. So the final, the final uh, two, um, record keepers are Mormon and Moroni, father and son. Mormon identifies that when he was only like 10 years old, he was taken by another record keeper and trained in this language. It probably was not something that the general public would have understood anymore because you're, you're centuries removed from Lehi and Nephi, right? So yeah. that whatever that was is basically a very academic language that's probably held by a very small group. And there's only a few people who probably can even read it. Kind of the way that Hebrew had become at the time of Christ. Hebrew was not the lingua franca amongst the Israelites and certainly not amongst the, the Roman Empire generally, right? Greek mm. was actually the more common tongue amongst most, most peoples. Most people spoke Greek. But we know from the New Testament Gospels that Jesus spoke Aramaic, at least. Probably was trained somewhat in Hebrew, but with the Septuagint, he wouldn't have had to have been able to read Hebrew. Probably did, but he wouldn't have needed to. Paul seems to, whenever he quotes from the Hebrew scriptures, is quoting from the Greek Septuagint. So there's no real evidence that Paul necessarily could read Hebrew. Hebrew wasn't necessarily a popular language at the time. So that's that's kind of the story. So that same kind of a thing is happening amongst the Nephites, at least according to the Book of Mormon record. This is one of those complex things that most people who read it miss the first time yeah. they read through, right? But that must be happening. Um, there's a there's a part where Moroni and Ether is actually complaining about the awkwardness of this language. In fact, he laments that he and Mormon both lament that if they could write in Hebrew that the record would be better, it would be clearer, and it would be of greater worth. But they're kind of relegated to this kind of a shorthand type language that they're writing in because of the complexity of making plates and inscribing on the plates. They're saying this, this it's a laborious process. It's too difficult to, to, to make these plates and inscribe on them. So we can't really write in Hebrew. We, we, we wish we could, but we can't. But he says, even if we could write in Hebrew, the Hebrew has been reformed. It's been changed. It's not what Lehi had. We've corrupted the, the Hebrew into something different than it was. So with all that in mind, you know that the language that was on the Book of Mormon, if we even had the plates, and this is one of the things I kind of point out, people like, well, if we had the plates, we could analyze them. Well, yeah, you could analyze them. You could do metallurgical testing. You could probably figure out that the 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 creation of the plates is of ancient origin or whatever 
but that's really all you could identify or decipher from them because the actual inscriptions on the plates would have been gobbledygook. They would have kind of looked like something ancient, but they really would have been scribbly gobbledygook because the knowledge of whatever that was is long, long dead. I mean, the last prophet of the Book of Mormon died, you know, 1600 years before, um, or actually, well, so it would be 1400 years before Joseph Smith discovered the plates. So, so that, that really wouldn't have been, so he couldn't have been translating, even if he had been an academic with the training to do so. So what he, what he is, is when he says translating, which is a generic word he's using, what he means is, is God is telling him what's on the plates and he is transmitting that into the context that he has. So loose or tight, the issue with that is as scholars of the Book of Mormon would actually have to say, if you were to ask which one, they would say yes. Because we can't know for sure. What we do know is it says in, I think it's in 2 Nephi chapter 31, um, where it says that... Uh, yeah, it says, so in 2 Nephi 31, uh, let's see, verse 3, it says, For my soul delighteth in plainness, for after this manner doth the Lord God work among the children of men. And earlier, so this is in 2 Nephi chapter 31. So earlier, Nephi and his brother Jacob had been copying large passages from Isaiah into the text. And they were kind of bragging and talking about how wonderful Isaiah is because it's crystal clear. It's so easy to understand for them. Because again, at the very beginning of the Book of Mormon, Nephi talks about how he was trained in the learning of the Jews and after the learning of his fathers. So for him, Isaiah was just like, you know, reading any book. It was just plain and simple. But, you know, anybody who's read Isaiah would probably think this guy's dumb. Isaiah is really complicated. It's difficult to understand the imagery. His metaphors don't really make sense sometimes. The, the parables and, and other types of, of linguistic flavor that he uses are really difficult because we're so far removed from Isaiah's time period, right? So yeah. he goes on, he says, he says, he, he works among the men, uh, children. For the Lord gi God giveth light unto the understanding, for he speaketh, uh, uh, speaketh unto men according to their language, unto their understanding. So any Latter-day Saint that, that kind of understands a holistic understanding of what happened during the translation process of, of, Neph of Joseph Smith would probably say that God transmitted the Book of Mormon to a people in a specific context. So they would have been citizens of the United States who were Puritan in origin, mostly Protestant, very familiar with the King James Bible, um, and other types of theological and linguistic um, social understandings and presuppositions. And into that type of a framework, God would have had to have transmitted a 1400 year old ancient document. And so in that, in that process, um, <clears throat> sometimes whole chunks of the King James Bible look like they're just simply copied and pasted into the Book of Mormon. Now, and so some people kind of dismissively say, oh, well, this is just a chapter of Isaiah or whatever, or Malachi or whatever. The problem with doing that is, is that there are often changes to different words that are different from the KJV, and they're different for specific reasons. So it's important even so, even though you, you think, hey, this is just Isaiah chapter whatever. So even though you may think that, it's still important to read the whole chapter and compare it to the KJV, because that's the kind of linguistic style that Joseph Smith is using to transmit the Book of Mormon. So now with respect specifically to the mention you had of Christ. Yes, those would have been more uh, a product of they're referring to some kind of a messianic figure. But remember, this group of people are very different than the Jews in Israel, right? So the uh -huh. beginning of the book is Lehi leaving, is leaving Israel at a time 
when they are in an apostasy and they are being forgotten by their God, thus the Babylonian captivity and the exile into Assyria, right? So you have mm -hmm. the captivity of Assyria and Babylon. And so they come in and they kind of break up the Israelites. And so this is right before that happens. So their, their uh, failure to comply with the dictates of their God result in a fracturing of their system and their government and their land. So they're basically removed from their covenant land because they broke their covenant. Well, before that happens, there's a group that honor prophets and honor God speaking through prophets, and then they break off and form another group that continues to honor prophets and honor God speaking through prophets. And so as a consequence, they are given more information in a much more rapid way. That's why early on in the Book of Mormon, Nephi and Jacob start to kind of focus in on Isaiah and the messianic nature of Isaiah's predictions, right? Mm -hmm. Those are something that ancient Israel would have understood a Messiah's coming. But obviously, by the time you get to the first century in the ancient world, their Messiah is very different from what Jesus is, right? Yeah. Whereas, whereas in the Book of Mormon, they know exactly what their Messiah is supposed to be. Very early on, they're talking about God himself shall come down. He shall take upon himself flesh. He shall take upon himself the sins of the world. He shall be slain for the sins of the world as a lamb is slain, a, a lamb without blemish, a sinless sacrifice for sins, right? So you've got this, this imagery becomes very prevalent earlier in the text. And so it predates the Christian era, which is when that same kind of an understanding is delivered to the Israelites after Jesus's actual crucifixion. So the Book of Mormon, for me, kind of serves as a what if. What if the Israelites had actually listened to their prophets and, and understood the correct interpretations of their scriptures centuries before Jesus' birth. They wouldn't have failed to miss their Messiah had they done that. So even Jesus kind of speaks to this phenomenon in Matthew 23. It's in all three of the Synoptic Gospels, but in Matthew 23 specifically, I think it's in, in Mark 13 or whatever. But in, in, in those, it's in, yeah. And so in those passages, he's like, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets and stones those that are sent to you, how oft would I have gathered you, but you would not. So I've been sending prophets to you. And he laments the death of Abel and Zechariah, who was killed at the temple steps, kind of when the last vocal living prophets. And he's like, you guys, every time I send a prophet, you guys, you, you stone them and kill them. Why? Because they interpret the scriptures differently than you do. They try to give you more of God's word and you reject them. So in your apostasy, you guys are rejecting God's word, his ongoing flow of revelation to you. And in that state, I can't tell you the truth because you won't hear it. And so, but the Book of Mormon serves as a different people who don't have that kind of a problem. Now they do go through periods of apostasy, but their apostasy is very different in the sense that those groups that reject revelation break off from the, the, the larger group of what's called the Nephites, which would be equivalent to the Jews, and they become Lamanites, which would be equivalent to the Gentiles. They basically break off. They start following after other gods. You know, they're worshiping nature. They're worshiping whatever it is that they are. Some of them are rejecting that a god even exists. They're kind of playing with a, an atheistic kind of a worldview. But in the process of doing that, there's still this class of people that are a record keeper class of prophets and so the knowledge of the son of god is not only early on in the text but it also is pervasive throughout the text and that's why the book of mormon is a significant witness of christ because it shows that christ remembers his covenants with the house of israel and he will give them whatever information they're willing to receive now that's a long 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 explanation of what i'm talking about but it's the reason why it's not a Messiah necessarily that's that's been revealed to Joseph Smith as the word that is translated in the Book of Mormon, but rather a Christ. Christ is the Greek word, obviously, that means Messiah or anointed one. But that word resonates more with a 
with a 19th century Christian uh, audience, obviously. And when they read that word, they're not thinking Messiah, which could be confused with the apostate view of a Messiah that was held by the Pharisees and Sadducees, but rather a Christ, which is understood by the Greek speaking Christian authors of the New Testament. Does that make sense? Yeah, that makes sense. Follow that. So as far as loose or tight, I think it goes in and out. Some concepts, there's no choice but to remain kind of tight, which actually makes it difficult for us to really understand the Book of Mormon, which is why sometimes scholars will struggle with its language or its metaphor or what's going on, because it's unique to the Nephites. But loose, when it becomes something that is overlapping with either the New Testament or the Hebrew scriptures. Then it can be more loosely translated to a modern audience. But when they're talking about specifically Nephite things, the words become tight. An example of that would be like in Alma 11, when they're going through the Nephite monetary system, mm -hmm. which is actually a system of weights and measures of aunties and senums and that kind of thing. They're going through these different, different weights, um, which originally was really funny. Early Latter-day Saints, in the early chapter heading, they put that this was Nephite coinage, that this is the Nephites explaining their system of coins. There's no coins in the Book of Mormon. They're not, co they're not minting coins. What they're doing is they're doing a much more ancient system of weights and measures that was used in order to, to uh, navigate a monetary bartering type system. And so th what they're explaining, and if you look at it, it's like, this measurement is equivalent to double this measurement, which is double this measurement. And then this measurement is equivalent to all of the prior measurements. But see, what they're thinking is they're thinking like a, a, a dime is two nickels and a quarter is five nickels and two and a half dimes. So early, early readers of the Book of Mormon still miss the mark by reading into it their own cultural presuppositions. And modern LDS scholarship has read those out and said, look, the text doesn't mention coins. It's not talking about coins. It's actually more consistent with a system of weights and measures. So there are times when the Book of Mormon translation is more what you would call tight. And that would be one example of that. Um, whereas in other I ideas, talking about its theology as it relates to Christianity, it's going to sound more like the New Testament type of language. Alma is translated as making a lot of the same concepts of grace, of works, of, of reliance on Christ, his mercy. Those kinds of things are going to be more probably in the in the worldview as they were understood by uh, uh a group of protestants in the 19th century okay and one of the like you mentioned like height when it refers to like names and measurements and all that um one of the things that i had a question with was i think it was third nephi when it listed the disciples of christ in the americas um i think it specifically was let me see here wrote it down um Third Nephi 19.4. All right, no. Uh, yeah, yeah, I think that, yeah. Third Nephi 19.4. Um, okay. Like, Timothy, I think, was one of the disciples, I believe it, it said. And I believe that's a Greek name. So, like, how would that work? Yeah, so, yeah, so that's, there's a, there's a paper that's written on that. I can, I can pull and send you. I've got it downloaded on my on my laptop. It goes through the names. So um yeah, so Timothy, so there there's a there's a whole um field of scholarship that works on this issue. And what they do is they go back and they try to find, of course, again, Latter-day Saint scholars who believe the truth claims from a um a faithful perspective are trying to correlate the Book of Mormon and set it not only into an ancient context, which is what the historical, which is what the book is claiming. So not only are they trying to place it back in a, in a historical context, 
but they're also trying to work through those names. And there are some that have not been reconciled. And so it's like, well, you've got this name and it doesn't fit. It looks anachronistic. It looks like it's culturally wrong or something like that. Um, but then there are other names that they believed were were not didn't fit and they've since found that. Um, the the study of, of that kind of names um, is is it's a pretty robust area of, of Book of Mormon scholarship. Um, and I, I can send you papers on it. I don't off the top of my head. I don't. Okay. I don't remember all the names and how they are. It, the, I mean, the arguments are always really complicated because it's like we found this name in this text that dates to the, you know, seventh century BC in this manuscript of Hebrew or this inscription, we found this name that we once believed was not a Hebrew name or names that are often used, whether they're feminine or masculine. Originally it was believed it was only a girl's name, but then we found another, another example of it in a Hebrew setting in the ancient world where it's used as a masculine name. I think Alma is one of those. And so there's 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 certain names that they've been able to find that there's a corollary back to a Semitic origin in that way. Now, granted, not all the names are going to be that way. And, and interpreting a Greek. So is the name Greek? Well, whatever the name is, it would have had to have been translated and something akin to Timothy. So that's another way of looking at it as well. And so but. The reality of it is, is that's where Book of Mormon scholarship kind of is under attack by by critics because they're like, well, sometimes you guys just shrug your shoulders. But for me, one of the things I do like about LDS scholars is they don't make stuff up. If they don't know, they just say. Yeah, OK, that's a question we haven't answered yet. We'll keep digging. But I found that I found overwhelmingly that the majority of, of criticisms and claims like that, where people are kind of scratching their head as to why something's there, are answered in time. Because, I mean, there's a there's a list that you can find online of certain things that were believed to be anachronisms in the Book of Mormon that they've since found they would have existed in an ancient um, context in the Americas. Okay. So that even even sense. like even like horses, they're they're finding more and more evidence that there would have been something like horses in that culture. But even with that, a lot of times people will read chariots and horses. We don't really know what a Nephite chariot is, because in no context in the Book of Mormon is a chariot associated with any kind of war. It looks more like some kind of a cart, and it looks like it's more used so. They could have used a word like chariot and actually meant some kind of a conveyance or something. And it doesn't necessarily mean that they were ever pulled by whatever it was that they were calling a horse. And so people say, oh, you're just making excuses. Obviously, the easiest solution is that Joseph Smith wrote the Book of Mormon and he's just using what's around him. And, you know, he doesn't know anything about horses and chariots. And the claim I have for that is that if Joseph Smith was doing that, you probably would have seen more usage of things like horses dragging chariots into war, which would have been what he would have been familiar with in his own act, in his own setting. People would have been familiar with Rome and chariots. The stories would have been consistent with what he would have read in the biblical texts. But he doesn't do that. He doesn't go that far. So there's a mentions of horses and chariots, for example. But they're not doing the same things that one would expect somebody to do if they were just making up a story about horses and chariots and they were unfamiliar with um, historical timelines. So they would make an error that way. The usage that he has is more careful and it's more it's more uh, nuanced and, and very specific um, in, in its context and usage in the Book of Mormon. And to me, that shows that it was even if he was using those and he had written it he's awfully careful about how he uses the terms and the phrases in specific context to be careful not to over claim something that can't be supported. Does that make sense? Yeah, that makes sense. Um, and like you had mentioned about like the, the theology of the book of Mormon, and that's kind of what I noticed too. Actually, surprisingly, I didn't, when I was reading through, I didn't have 
too much problems with the theology, which was, I was quite surprised by that. I figured I would have a lot more issues with the theology, but theology wasn't, it, for the most part, I mean, there was like one or two spots that was kind of scratching my head over, but. What, what is, what is your, what is your background as far as, as far as theology is concerned? What, where do you kind of align? Um, probably wise? the closest, I, I go to a non-denominational church, but probably the closest would be Reformed Baptist. Mm -hmm. um, so I err a little bit more on the Calvinistic side. Not totally, but I kind of lean I would that say way. that that's an error. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I think, I think from what I understand, LDS are very much in the free will. <laughs> yeah, we, we like our free will. We like our free agency. We believe all men get to choose what they want to do. And God, yeah. God honors our choices and then holds us accountable for them. Yeah, we're very much that way. More of the theology I lean, but I... <laughs> did notice and like you had kind of said like the theology of the book of mormon is very more advanced i guess you could say than like compared to old testament you know old testament scriptures it seemed and that's one of the things that kind of interested me um like i noticed especially in like first nephi 10 like there's um like in some ways it almost seems like almost word for word it's quoting like John chapter one, um, and then there's a section where it seems to almost quote Romans chapter 11, um, like first Nephi 10 verses seven and 10 seems to correspond to like John 1, 23 to 29. Um, and then first Nephi 10, 14 seems to compare the Romans 11, 24 and 25. So it definitely was uh, like, to me, there's two ways that it could go either it was that's the Holy Spirit revealing, you know, that right, which aspect. is which is what we would say. Or it's Joseph yeah. Smith just, just copying concepts yeah. out of the New Testament. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. but one of the things, when I was the first Nephi ten fourteen and how it compared to Romans eleven, because Romans eleven seems to be about how the Jews and Gentiles become one, you know, in Christ, and how the, you know, there is that imagery of like a tree an olive tree and the, the gentiles and jews are you know part of that tree the jews unbelieving jews get cut off but they can be regrafted re in um but ephesians chapter three paul seems to first verses four and six paul seems to indicate that that the idea that jews and gentiles becoming one wasn't revealed in previous ages but it was revealed only during the new testament era um and so I was wondering, like, because I know you guys believe the same scriptures as far as, um, like, the the Bible. You know, we, we believe the same Bible. So, like, when an LDS person reads Ephesians chapter 3, like, what would be, how would they square that with um, First Nephi chapter 10 of how that was revealed in, like, 600 B.C.? Yeah, just kind of like what I said in my my big, long monologue is the this idea of so the story is i mean oftentimes i, I talk to protestants and evangelicals and they'll say well the bible is a story and it was completed with the, the apostles of jesus you know, after jesus so it started with moses and and moses is the first author and it ends with whoever they think is the last author of the biblical text and that tells the complete narrative. God interacts with humans. He makes a covenant with Abraham. He fulfills that covenant in Christ, and that redeems all of humanity. The message is delivered to one people who then share that message with the world, and that's how God ultimately saves the world. So that, that message is going to be something that would certainly have been taught amongst the prophets, certainly. Um, so like Abraham in John, Jesus talks about, you know, he says, if you were Abraham's seed, you would do the works of Abraham. Um, and then he, he talks about how Abraham saw my day and was glad, kind of inferring that Abraham's had some vision of the last days, or at least the times that Jesus was then living and Jesus's mission. I mean, you, then you have the image of, of abraham sacrificing isaac which is you know any christian scholar is going to look at that as a type of god sacrificing his son and 
you know, showing that there would there would need to be a, a substitutionary sacrifice for the sacrifices that humans perform, but a sacrifice that God provides, kind of an idea with the replacement of Isaac with a with a with a ram that's provided by God. And you know, all the imagery that you could extrapolate from what these stories mean, right? Um, a, a Hebrew or Israelite context is going to look very different from what a later Christian is going to interpret those texts, certainly. And we see that with the production of the New Testament, where the New Testament Christians are interpreting the texts in very different ways than their Pharisee, Sadducee, slash, you know, whatever other philosophies are existing amongst Jews at that time would have understood those texts. I mean, obviously, you know, they say like the crucifixion and, and resurrection of Jesus was a stumbling block for the Jews because the concept of a literal physical resurrection was kind of contrary to not only their worldview, but their theology at the time. So there's a lot of kind of complexity going into understanding what Israelites would have understood as compared to what Christians interpret Israelite texts to mean. But here the Book of Mormon is bridging the two and doing it very early on. So if you look at the very first texts of the Book of Mormon, Lehi, one of the very first things that he says is, I saw God sitting on his throne, and I saw one like God come down with 12. So Lehi is seeing Christ's ministry 600 years prior. That's where the Book of Mormon begins with Lehi's visions. Lehi is not saying a king messiah is going to come to redeem us and help us to conquer all the foreign invaders, to kick out all of the heathen nations, and isolate Israel as the you know, sole exclusive land of, of Yahweh. So that, that's, not, that's the message that would have been understood by later Jews in the Second Temple period, right? That's mm -hmm. how they were. They became very isolationist. But early on, that was not their understanding. And that's what Lehi is kind of getting at. Our job is to be the foundation upon which the gospel, the message of the Messiah can be established so that it can thereafter be strong enough to be carried to the world. But see, Lehi understands that all the way back in First Nephi chapter 1. So you would see a more advanced progression of the ideals coming quicker from those sources than you would have as a consequence of what's what we see happening in the Hebrew Bible, where you've got you know either Malachi or Zechariah, whichever one is considered the, the final text of, of, the, of the Hebrew canon. And then you've got this, you know, three or four century gap between the inscripturation of the New Testament. Where, where really nothing is being produced that would be considered authoritative scriptures. You know, you've got the Maccabees and things like that, but they're not going to be prophetic writings um, held on par with the with the scriptures of Israel. And so this this translation this uh, this transmission process is going to be accelerated in the Book of Mormon. But that's what I would expect. And so yes, concepts like those found in the writings of Paul. Paul is an Israelite who doesn't get it, doesn't understand the message. His understanding of the Messiah is that Jesus is a false Messiah who is leading away Israelites after a cult that has broken off from the true vine and is apostate, and they are corrupting Israel as a product of their false preaching of their false Messiah, who is no different than any other false Messiah that Rome also put to death. That's Paul's kind of mission and his message. Um, Gamaliel seems to be a little bit more wise, saying if this movement's going to be um, uh, come to naught, then it'll come to naught. There's no reason to overtly go and kill it. It'll either die on its own or won't. But Paul goes out, commissioned probably by the Sanhedrin, to persecute this sect. But then his conversion results in texts like Galatians, like Ephesians, like um, Romans, etc., where he is completely within a, the course of just months, completely reinterpreting the scriptures of Israel as their mission was to be exactly what 
the Book of Mormon is claiming. We are the um, foundation that that was built by the builder upon which the salvation of the world could be established, right? Mm -hmm. So that that to me is 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 what I would understand. But yes, the claim is from you know from a more critical perspective is obviously Joseph Smith just borrowing Paul and concepts from the New Testament. He's reading them in the Book of Mormon and he's doing so anachronistically. That's the other way to do it. And that's actually one of the things I love about LDS studies is there's these, this story makes sense, but this one also makes sense. Yeah, yeah, there's definitely two ways you can look at it for sure. And it's, it's like that with everything that yeah. comes out of, you know, the, the history of Joseph Smith, you know, he practiced polygamy, he engaged in some kind of spiritual ceilings, whatever he was doing with that. And he was either doing it because he wanted to create a harem or because he was commanded by God to do uh, to engage in some ancient revival of a practice that was practiced by the patriarchs. And it established Latter-day Saints as a very tight knit community. And as you research Latter-day State history up into the Utah period, you see that the um, the practice of plural marriage actually had several very positive benefits culturally for Latter-day Saints in Utah. And you can say, which were unexpected and people outside didn't, didn't think would happen. In fact, they thought it would be very detrimental. But then you even have wives and women who were involved in the practice writing books and articles and newspapers and publishing how beneficial the practice is to women's rights and their ability to have autonomy and own land and pursue education which is not what you would expect from a polygamous society that the women would be liberated you just wouldn't expect that but that's what that was that's the product of what was happening in utah granted obviously there were some people who were corrupting it and abusing the practice but for the most part what was happening is something that was that was actually generating a positive outcome which is why women continue to fight to support it as the government came in and tried to stop the practice so there's there's two ways of looking at it, but you have to kind of let it play out, see which one you decide. And obviously, I understand critics of the church who choose the contrary side. What I don't like about it is that they always have to misrepresent that the other side is completely ludicrous, which it's not. And that's yeah. where I have a hard time with them. It's like, okay, I, I would be fine if you could fairly represent both sides and you just chosen one of them over the other because that's what i've done i can fairly and accurately represent the opposite side of my argument and i understand it i just don't agree with it because i've made a choice that i think the evidence favors this one over that one and partly because the other side of it um the conclusion of that is atheism for me and i, I yeah. choose to believe in god so yeah, I would think it's important the steel man rather than straw man for sure. Which is what I mostly see from critics of the church. Yeah. I don't see a lot of very honest critics who steel man our arguments or really do the work. I mean, a lot of them that, that pretend to do the work. Um, there are some historians of, of our church that engage in what looks like good, um, rigorous historical scholarship, but it actually ends up being, you know, shoddy in some areas because they do have a bias um unfortunately and this is a complex argument maybe for another day but unfortunately the nature of latter-day saint theology and claims often creates out of its um those who leave the faith it creates atheism yeah yeah because what happens is our <clears throat> Our faith, um, like we don't adhere to the doctrine of sola scriptura, which is a very common Protestant doctrine. Mm -hmm. So um, from my perspective, the, the idea of sola scriptura doesn't make a lot of sense because it basically concludes that the inscripturation of the biblical canon was something that was intended by God and that the purposes of prophets and apostles was to generate this canon and then to leave it to us through the ministrations of the Holy Spirit to understand God's will for us today. All, all people who are born again receive the Holy Spirit to help them to understand the biblical texts and to understand God's word and will, right? 
that that's probably a pretty clear understanding of the way that they view the Bible. So the Bible holds a very prominent place in, in Protestant thought because it is God's word. And so for, from my perspective, though, I look at it as the biblical texts are the result of the faithful diligence of God's living servants and oracles who also write, but they also speak. And what they also did was anytime any, anybody lacked any clarity, God would reconcile or resolve that lack of clarity by additional oral preaching or additional written inscripturation. And so what we see is I see that the closure of the biblical canon to me is the, is the actual objective evidence of an apostasy where people close off the idea that God can continue to speak through either apostles or prophets, and he can continue to clarify his will and word through a living oracle. To me, that's apostate. I think that that's the same kind of problem that happened prior to Jesus's birth amongst the Israelites in Jerusalem because and, and, and the areas in the diaspora, because they had rejected a living oracle. They, they no longer believed in prophets. They created kind of a priestly class of academics whose job it was to interpret scripture, and they had done so wrongly. And so Jesus comes along and effectively says, the canon is open. I'm going to explain these texts, and so are my servants, inspired by not only me, but by the Holy Spirit, and they will correct all of your errors. And not only will they preach those corrections, but they will write them down. But obviously that process would need to conti continue over time because a 2000 year old closed canon is so far removed both in time linguistically and culturally from a 21st century english speaking context that it's difficult to go back and fully understand not only what the authors intended but specifically how their authors how their audience would have received those texts and that's a problem and that gap between author's meaning and understanding of an audience and time and changes in language that those those difficulties can't be overcome by scholarship alone you also have to have the inspiration of god and the clearest and most direct way for him to do that is to do it the way he did it in the biblical text which is by calling an apostle or prophet to perform that function so for as for so for me when you make that kind of a claim, <clears throat> and that's your basis as a Latter-day Saint, is that we have scripture, but also we have apostles or prophets that lead, and you start to believe that the prophets aren't real prophets, and then you start to go back to the, the scriptures, and you make arguments that Joseph Smith wrote the Book of Mormon, and it's all hogwash, and he just copied from different sources, and he cobbled it together, it's all a manufactured bunch of hooey. Then what you do is you take that same critical lens and you go to the Bible and you start doing the same thing with the Bible. You start saying, oh, there's no evidence for a historical Moses. There's no evidence for a historical flood. The, you know, the Genesis accounts of creation are, are, you know, they're contrary to what science teaches us. So then you just completely destroy faith completely. So these kind of ultra fundamentalist views are dangerous to somebody who's trying to maintain faith in God because God doesn't work in in a literal context, the way that we often think. I mean, I talk, I talked to somebody who was a, and I, I don't know how you view the biblical text, but I talked to somebody the other day that was, <clears throat> he was a King James onlyist. Oh and yeah. I actually grew up, I grew up that way. <laughs> yeah. And you don't sound like you're that way, but it was no. really hard, really yeah. hard to talk to him. Because <laughs> he's like, he literally thinks not only the Bible, but the King James Bible. Yeah, God's intent. And I'm like, so God didn't deliver his whole word until, you know, 1611. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Until the 17th century. I'm like, seriously? So that doesn't really. So what did people do before then? And yeah, so, and really what it comes down to is he's heard some things at his church. They sound good. I mean, a lot of his arguments were very, very common kind of talking points that 
are, they just belie a lack of critical thinking. It's like, dude, just think about that for a second, what you're saying. So his whole thing was, you have modern scholars and modern scholarship that you're relying on because, of course, modern scholars, regardless of what you think of them, they have more information because there have been more discoveries since 1611, right? Yeah. We have a lot more manuscripts in the manuscript tradition than we had in 1611. I think we were like 100 copies of the Greek New Testament. And you're talking still fragmentary copies, but they didn't, we didn't have near the vast numbers of textual, um, you know, the, the families of texts that come out of the, out of the text tradition of, of the copyists and scholars and scribes from, from centuries past. We didn't have them. We didn't have them available. And so scholars relied on very small numbers of, of manuscripts in order to comprise and compose the the thing he also doesn't understand that the, he didn't even understand the history of the composition of the King James. Yeah, they don't. They don't. Yeah, <laughs> that the, the majority of it was translated by one person, and the King James scholars basically just kind of checked his work and did a little bit of changes to it. So it, it wasn't even like a. a just, but he, his whole thing was the the greatest linguists that ever lived lived in 1611, and they're the ones who we should believe. And I said, were they, were they prophets? I mean, what's, no, no, they were just the, the smartest people who have ever known languages. I'm like, well, it's nice that you believe that. But so those kinds of ideas though, once you kind of, you know, they built this glass house and once you go in there with a rock and start throwing rocks at the walls, their whole world starts to crumble because it's built on glass. It's built on a yeah. sand foundation. And so it's really important to kind of have have the the robust have a robust enough system of theology and belief that it can sustain itself in the in the um, in the face of real criticism, real objective attack, because it happens. And so that that's one of the reasons why I'm a Latter Day Saint is because we do believe whether the belief is true or not. And what I mean by that is whether or not um, the president of our church is actually an apostle equivalent to a Peter or a Paul or a James, and whether or not the quorum of the Twelve are equivalent to the quorum of the Twelve that are called by Christ, whether they have the same mantle, power, authority, and, and revelatory um, ability, I'm still making that claim and that claim makes sense because whether they're doing it or not, at least I would expect that to be consistent with God's pattern as it's been revealed in the biblical text and actually culminated in the revelation of the biblical text. I don't believe that God would just simply reveal documents and then close off the period of special revelation and then basically rely on academics and scholars because repeatedly we're told not to put our, our, our trust in the arm of flesh. Now, the contrary argument, which I understand well, is, well, they're just guys and you're just trusting men. Well, Moses was just a guy and they were just trusting men. Abraham was just a guy and they were just trusting men. The fact that Abraham and Moses and them spoke to God was a matter of faith and belief by those who followed them. And even all of the prophets throughout the, the Hebrew Bible, it's not like all of them did what Elijah did and called down pillows of fire from heaven to, to validate their prophetic mission. Some of them just preached, and the people had to listen. And so um, they would have negative consequences of fact of not listening to the preaching. But of course, those could be just attributed to, right? You could just say, well... Babylon overcame us because we didn't prepare for war properly. Or our king sucked. Like you can just blame it on something else, right? So, like, well, it's not because we killed the prophets. It's because you know our king's not very good at ruling the world. So, um, so we fell into we fell into this this negative situation. So, but yeah, I, I I really I really kind of that that's kind of how I I ground 
my my acceptance of the Book of Mormon, if that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah, that kind of does. Um, now, what would happen? What would happen if, like, the the leaders of the LDS Church were to go, like, say something like really, really wild? I'm trying to think of something that would be like totally contrary to the biblical text. Like, I don't know, let's just do a day of rage, and I don't know, like, let's just go out and yeah, whatever. Yeah. Let's do, a, like let's do a purge. Let's do a purge. Yeah. Yeah. Basically, like Viking, you know, like medieval Vikings would do. You yeah. know, like what would, how would a faithful LDS saint navigate that? Um, well, we see evidence of that happening in the biblical text. <laughs> yeah. The prophets come in. I always think that's a funny question because I don't think the Israelites did anything that would be you know shocking but they believe god told them to do it right go go kill the amalekites go go kill you know right go murder and slay go destroy go you know take take their wives destroy their men burn their fields destroy their i mean they were asked to do some of the i mean i, I think that would be the most horrible thing is to engage in some kind of a genocide to wipe out an entire civilization or people, right? As a consequence of what? They were mean to us a long time ago, right? They didn't receive us when we came out of Egypt a long time ago, so we're going to go back and take vengeance on them. So now now granted, I, I've got a friend who's a, <clears throat> he's a Hebrew scholar. Um, he's an Old Testament scholar. He's also, he he's uh, pretty robust in Egyptology. And and he struggles with those passages because they are they're just they're, they're hard. not yeah huh they're hard yeah they're they're hard to deal with it's hard to wrestle with you know God telling you know go go kill everybody it, it's hard to kind of reconcile that with this God I mean there's ways you can make an apology you know an apologist argument comes in and it's like well one to God death is not a bad thing. When human beings die, they return to their maker. Amongst these these groups would have been innocent people. The innocent people wouldn't have been culpable for the sins of the people. So they would have been received into the eternal felicity of their God. You can come up with any kind of, of whatever you want. but So that that's actually one of the dangers of religion that's argued by atheists like you know Christopher Hitchens and, and Richard Dawkins and people like that, that basically in as long as somebody claims god told me to do it you can basically justify any action you want because you could say god told me now many christians today would say god doesn't do that today there is no person who would do that we have the biblical text it contains what it contains the only thing god's going to tell us is to accept and believe in christ and to read the bible and to extrapolate from it the principles of life lessons but we see that there are groups that, in fact, it's really funny to me. I often have to kind of tell our missionaries that because oftentimes they get the, <clears throat> how do you know Joseph Smith wasn't a cult leader like David Koresh or Jim Jones? And I say, well, because they did completely different things, first of all, whereas Jim Jones killed his people and David Koresh got his people killed, uh, Joseph Smith was willing to die to keep his people safe because they were being threatened with war if they didn't relinquish him. But Joseph Smith could have just simply made a command on the more than 5,000 members of the Nauvoo Legion and a 5,000 member strong army in the United States at that time would have been very difficult to defeat, especially surrounding one person. So he could have just said, I'm tired of this. Guard me. I don't want to die. Go and protect me. But rather than doing that, he told everybody to stay home and that he would subject himself to whatever whatever the people wanted to do and knew that by doing so, he would probably be killed. And I said, that's very different than a Jim Jones or a David Koresh, ultimately the end of his life. He went and died by himself with his brother and told his brother not to go, but he went and died by himself with his brother rather than sacrificing his people for himself, which is what they did. So I said that alone kind of differentiates it. But 
their claims are very different also. So Joseph Smith, while he is claiming to receive authority from God, we call the priesthood, to administer the church, he very quickly started distributing that authority to other men. He didn't just retain it to himself. He remained the leader of the church, but he distributed that, that power to a quorum of 12 apostles, 12 men to a council that he then put in authority over the group rather than maintaining that power for himself. He doesn't seem to want to keep it. So that's very different as well. But Jim Jones and David Koresh were sola scriptura, biblical inerrantist type people. And they believed that what they were doing was a product of interpreting the scriptures, specifically Revelation, right? They had these, they were using Daniel and Revelation to create their groups and that they were just the person commissioned by God to correctly interpret those biblical texts. But they were using the authority that they are that, that the people believed that was vested in the scripture of the Bible to manipulate them. And so the reality of it is, is even the belief that there are no living prophets, there are no living apostles, doesn't protect a group from somebody claiming that their specific interpretation of scripture is correct and thereby corrupting a group by doing that. Because you can use the biblical texts to, to justify a lot of horrific behaviors. Oh, yeah, right? for sure. So, I mean, early in the, you know, the antebellum South, I mean, they used all kinds of passages to justify slavery. I mean, it's not like the people who enslaved Africans were, you know, were not Bible-believing Christians. They all were. I mean, these are good church-going folk. They were Baptists and Methodists and all kinds of stuff. But they still had slaves. And they mistreated those slaves, and they justified it to themselves by saying that there was something wrong with them, and God wanted them in that servitude. And they looked to passages in the Old Testament, and Deuteronomy, etc., and said, see, God allows us to own people. And so that that's the dangers of it. So in answer to your specific question, the prophets are bound by two things. One, our society is becoming more civilized. The idea that we would ever do a Viking, you know, berserker rage and go kill a neighboring civilization. I, it's far-fetched, for sure. Yeah, I think it's that everybody would be like, like, I think that President Nelson's lost it. <laughs> <laughs> so the other thing, too, is... In our tradition, it's one of the big criticisms of the church. <clears throat> our apostles and prophets have taught things that are not compatible with our current understanding of things today. And as, but what's really interesting about them is that it seems that the people to whom those things were presented understood that those were the specific musings or beliefs of that individual who was espousing them. Whether they were a member of the Twelve Apostles or if they were even the president of the church, it seems that there was not unanimity, unanim unanimity amongst this quorum, which is required. So it's not like President Nelson could get up and say, I received a revelation last night, and I think that we all need to pick up our axes and go chop up all the people in the city over here. As horrific as that sounds. The other apostles would be like, um, uh, come, come here, come here. Let's let's uh, everybody disregard that. Let's go. <laughs> Th that would that would be the action. So unless un in, in, in the case of an extreme circumstance like that, it would require the the unanimous voice of the first presidency, which is three apostles and the quorum of the 12 apostles, which is a separate body. They would have to speak as one on that subject. So we have what you know, what you might call governmentally a system of checks and balances for that kind of extreme conduct. Our apostles are grounded in scripture, what's been revealed. And anything that is revealed to us today is built on a progression of what has been. So we are not surprised typically by what they say which is, I think, one of the ways that God confirms it to the people. And that's why Latter-day Saints are so readily willing to be obedient to what we're commanded, 
because a lot of times we expect it. So when President Nelson came out a few years ago and told people that they needed to obey the government's advice with respect to the COVID pandemic, most members weren't shocked by that. Now, is that revelation from God binding on the church? Um, I think it was more in the sense of we're good citizens. That is our doctrine. Our doctrine is to be subject to kings, rulers, presidents, magistrates, etc. We honor, we obey, and sustain the laws of the land in which we live. And so our prophet's guidance to obey the counsel and advice of those that we elect and put into power above us, we would expect him to say that. Right. So, but yeah. for the equivocating member who's like, should I, should I do this or should I reject it or should I rebel against it? Well, the counsel of the, of, of the leaders of the church to helps us to dispel any doubt by saying, look, again, as members of the church, we covenant and we commit to being obedient to the governments in which we, we obey. Now, again, part of that also is the right to oppose the actions of government but to do so in a peaceable and lawful way. So if you disagree, please do so in a peaceable and lawful way. And so those are those are the things that we would expect. But yeah, we're not going to have any extreme pronouncements or anything like, like that. that. Yeah, I, I just, it's just, it's not in the cards. Um, one of the, the funny things is that members of the church often joke that uh, God has a very easy way of dealing with a wayward prophet. That is true. Yeah. From what I understand, it's more of a, because I've been doing a lot of research about the LDS church. And from what I understand, it's more of a seniority thing. So like a lot of times. It is. Of it's absolutely a seniority. Yeah. The senior. the senior, yeah, the, the, the senior apostle is the president of the church. That's been the way it's been since Brigham Young. Brigham Young became the president of the church because he was the, he was the senior apostle. John Taylor was the senior apostle and so on and so on and so on. That That's who's the president of the church, the senior most apostle. The reason we get that is because Peter was the senior apostle, and it's presumed that he was the leader of the apostles. He seems to be the most outspoken advocate. Now, <clears throat> there is leadership responsibility, for example, in Jerusalem by James. Paul has a specific ministry and calling, which he seems to be leading um, but he's doing so in conjunction with the other apostles, right? He's not completely off in left field doing his own thing totally, but he does have a lot of autonomy because he does have a specific mission. And obviously God trusts him to do that. Paul has a, has a very you know unique um, manner in which he was called, of course, but, um, but yeah, so the convenience of the church today. So one of the things I explained to people is, the reason we believe that the the loss of the apostle, apostolic ministry will never happen again is simply a matter of practicality more than anything else. In the ancient world, if somebody came into a village and said something you didn't like, it was very easy to just kill that person. They could just the people could just riot and kill them. And what's going to happen, right? Some People might tell you that was a bad thing to do, and I mean, what are they going to do? Yeah. Round us all up and string us up? I mean, yeah, if, if if a group of Jews had killed a Roman official, yeah, they'd probably send a, a garrison and kill them all. But a bunch of Jews killed another Jew because he was speaking Jew stuff that the Jews didn't like. Yeah, Rome's not going to care too much. And the Sanhedrin isn't going to care if they kill a Christian. Right. Oh, some of those follows, followers of that false messiah we had crucified and this group of Jews killed him. So there would have been kind of support for persecuting those who followed Christ. So it's not something that, that would have been in favor early on, especially. Now, granted, as soon as there was political power behind Christianity, that stopped being the case. You couldn't touch a priest, for example, yeah. in the 10th century without a severe backlash by some government authority some monarch would probably put you to death if you have persecuted a priest so just based on the practicality the establishment of civilization and government uh, the apostles um, aren't really under the threat of that kind of consequence as a result of their preaching 
in addition to if one of them does die or is killed in any kind of a circumstance, it's very convenient for them to board a plane, fly back together, and call a new one. Replacing their number is easy. Hell, they could do it over a Zoom call now. Yeah. Where they can meet. And, so it really is more of a product of modern technology has established a method. Uh, modern civilization, the cultivation of a, of a more civilized way in which humans interact. All of these things together have established a way in which it would be impossible to kill the leadership of what we believe is Christ's church to the degree that it could ever be lost from the earth again. It would take a concerted, directed effort by some very powerful entity to do that. And that's just not probable. 